You know what? Fine. Let's watch. Let's watch it with Benny Johnson. Ah, why not? Let's watch it with Benny Johnson. This is going to be great. We can have... It'll be as if you're getting both the yin and yang. You're getting both perspectives. You're getting the perspective of the guy giving money to Russian shell companies. And you get the perspective of me here in Kiev. So you've got like both sides, you know? Yin and yang, yin and yang. This is the spot that commemorates where George Washington crossed the Delaware River on Christmas 1776, the night before the Battle of Trent. First, a look at today's other headlines. North Carolina's governor mm. says nearly $100 million in relief aid has already have okay, a problem. Are we getting into the interview? Now climb seven. Likely interview. Yeah. interview, please. There we go. And specifically, the influx of illegal immigrants from okay. is Start one of the key. tell pollsters all over the Nervous. country and here in Pennsylvania that immigration is one of the key issues that they're looking at this election. Hey, and thanks specifically for the, right the influx side. of illegal immigrants from more than 150 countries. How many illegal immigrants would you estimate your administration has released into the country over the last three and a half years? Well, I'm glad you raised the issue of immigration because I agree with you. It is a, it is a, a topic of discussion that people want to rightly have. And you. What even is that? Does the question mean like anybody who's crossed the border illegally, like anyone who's entered? Or do they mean people that they've grabbed and then they've released to like pretrial detention or they've just released to then show up to a court for the date later? Or I assume it's the latter is what he's asking. You know what I'm going to talk about. Yeah, but right you're now, just a number. Is, Do you but, think but, it's but, one million, three million? I roll things right. in five bits, five hundred bits. Point. Okay. The point is that we have uh, a broken immigration system that needs to be repaired. So your and, homeland security secretary said that eighty-five well, no, percent of I'm apprehensions. Finished. I'm not finished. We have a we have it's an a rough immigration estimate of six million people have been released. Be, into the country. And let me just finish. I'll get to the question. I promise you. I was beginning to answer. And when <laughs> when you came into office, you're admitting. Okay, can I just throw out here? And people can discount this, uh, certainly if you're not of my political persuasion. The interview with Trump would not be going like this. I'm just going to say, if it was Trump right now being interviewed on Fox, I don't know if it would be Brett Baer doing it. I think it'd probably be somebody else. And I think they'd at least let him finish his thought before jumping on him with data. Now, I'm not saying that to say that it's completely unfair to jump on her with data, even though it probably could have let her talk first. Uh, but I'm just saying that there would be a different standard. I mean, just listen, when, they, when Trump calls into Fox, all of those years where Trump was just calling in and basically just rambling for like 30, 40 minutes at a time, and they all sat there and he's saying all n sorts of nonsense. And you've got like the ent entire like Fox morning team just sitting there with dead eyes because they're all like hopped up on coffee, barely awake, and then they... This is their alarm clock in the morning, right? Is that are they giving good pushback in those scenarios? No, not usually. Again, this is this type of journalistic rigor immediately coming out with data. I'm not necessarily against it. I'm just saying that Harris has agreed by this decision to be on this network to enter the lion's den, so to speak, where Trump is right now hunkering down. He didn't agree to a second debate. He said it was because the election was too close and people had already started voting, which, I mean, if that's the case then give up your campaign. If it's too late to convince people, Burns why are you campaigning? Why are you buying ads? Why are you doing anything? It's man. it's like the, I think it's one of the worst excuse I've heard from him to dodge an event, especially the second presidential debate where this was something where he used to be known for. Back in 2015, he cut his teeth on those debates and now he's put turning them down. A little weird, a little weird. Bob and Wap, thank you so much for the gifted tier one sub. Um, he is hunkering down and some interviews are being canceled. I know Harris also canceled the Times interview, but it probably wasn't as aggressive as this interview where Trump canceled the 60 minutes interview. He doesn't want to do a second debate. So he is taking, she is taking a certain amount of risk here. The Trump isn't. And this could pay off where people ex appreciate that boldness. They appreciate her going to networks where she's not going to get necessarily the nicest shake. And people say, oh, look, she's bold. She's She has strength or so, or X, Y, Z. Or it produces a bunch of bad clips because the questions are framed in a certain way or she doesn't perform well. And then Trump, by saying nothing at all, helps himself in the best way possible. But we'll see. Administration Ooh. immediately reversed a number oh. of Trump border policies. Most significantly, the we're going to get a lot of goofy noises from Benny Johnson tonight, aren't we? Oh, ah, ooh, eh. He didn't even get to say anything yet, and he's, he's citing data. She said, let me finish my question. He doesn't. I mean, finish my answer. He doesn't let her finish the answer. Then he goes reading this data. 
and we're saying, ooh, ah, ee, like before we've gotten it. I mean, whatever, I guess you could say, ooh, tough question, but I don't know if we should be making like uh, Mortal Kombat noises, like, ooh, ah, ee, at this, <laughs> this stage we just started. The policy that required illegal immigrants to be detained through deportation, either in the US or in Mexico. And you switch that policy. They were released from custody awaiting trial. So instead, included in those were a large number of single men, adult men, who went on to commit heinous crimes. So looking back, do you regret the decision to terminate Remain in Mexico at the beginning of your administration? At the beginning of our administration, within practically hours of taking the oath, the first bill that we offered Congress before we worked on infrastructure, before the Inflation Reduction Act, before the Chips and Science Act, before any, before the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the first bill, practically within hours of taking the oath, was a bill to fix our immigration system. Yes, ma'am. It was called and, the U.S. Citizen, and, Citizenship Act of 2021. Exactly. It and, was essentially and so, but, but a I, pathway I, to citizenship for the... Finish, yes, may, I finish, may I finish responding, but please? You, but, this, but you have to let me finish, You please. had the White House and the House and the Senate, I'm and they the didn't bring up that bill. I'm in responding to the point you're raising, okay. and I'd like to finish. Yes, ma'am. We recognized from day one that to the point of this being your first question, it is a priority for us as a nation and for the American people. And our focus has been on fixing a problem. And from day one, that- Honestly, it might serve Red Bear better to just let her finish like some amount of a statement before me to lead like, yes, when you proposed that bill, it was this, yeah, she mentioned the bill in passing. It was just gonna move and then you could Bring up the bill later. Why jump on her like that? Why even give her the room to be like, I was there and Fox News, you know, they were trying to get me as Fox News does. Like, why even? I mean, whatever. We have done enough. And you know, crazily enough, Brett Bear, out of everybody at Fox, is the one that would be closest to giving her a fair interview. Uh, and I don't take from that what you will. Take from that about Brett Bear, whatever you want to take about that, and take from that about Fox News, whatever you want to take from that number of things, including to address our asylum system and pour, put more resources, getting more judges, what we needed to do to tighten up penalties and increase penalties for illegal crossings, what we needed to do to deal with points, points of entry between border entry points. That's the work we did, and we worked on supporting what was a bipartisan effort, including some of the most conservative members of the United States Congress. James Langford is the main one, but yeah. To actually strengthen the border. That border bill- Watching people try to like, well, James Langford never was that conservative after the bill, after he came out, I was like, no, man, they just sunk it. They sunk it because, you know, politics and this sucks. And, oh, well, you know, when Lindsey Graham said they sunk it for political reasons and not for like the material conditions of it, you know, and then another Senator came out and said, like, no, 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 they're, you know, they're all loyal, they're all anti disloyal, they're all anti-Trumpers, even though they're all out there trying to get Trump elected right now, it makes no sense for them to lie about it. Would have put 1,500 more border agents at the border, which is why I believe the Border Patrol agents supported the bill. It would have allowed us to stem the flow of fentanyl coming into the United States, which is a scourge affecting people of every background. I mean, it was crazy. They could have just said, yes, okay, pass the bill, but then afterwards say, it only took the election it took the election to make them act. Once they saw election day coming around, that was when they came down to the table to negotiate after us Republicans played hardball with the foreign aid. Like they could have sold it and they could have sold it as a conservative concession policy achievement, but no, no. Every geographic location in our country killing people. It would have allowed us to put more resources into prosecuting transnational criminal organizations, which I have done yes, as the attorney general, former attorney general of a border state. Madam Vice President, a couple prosecuted of Prosecuted trafficking of drugs, six, guns, and human beings. Six and Donald Democrats, Trump, but let me just finish. Six and Democrats Donald voted Trump against that bill. learned about that bill and told them to kill it because he preferred to run on a problem instead of fixing a problem. And in this election, this is rightly a discussion He's grabbing that time. The American people want to have and what they want. I love these. By the way, you see these like notes that come up on screen, like she's going down, et cetera. 
these i don't know if you guys know this about youtube but you have to choose to put these up so these aren't like just randomly generated messages he's he's like going through and you can see him looking at the screen right now he's like choosing them he's choosing the the hype man to put up there you know i, I have never done that on youtube i don't know if i should do that um I, I mean people do like seeing the chat and stuff but like if you want to see the messages like i don't know they're on this they're on the screen we have you know we have like three separate chats and you can only see one of them on screen uh, I don't know. I would find it distracting, but I know a ton of YouTubers do. It's not like a specific critique. Our I just find it funny. Like, let me find a comment to hype. Yeah, she's going down. Woo, yeah. Let me find another one. Yeah, she's on. She's burning. Yeah. I don't know. And they want a president of the United States who's not playing political games with the issue, I hear you. but actually is focused on fixing Six it. Six Democrats voted against that bill. It would have allowed 1.8 million illegal immoral, immigrants into the country. Hey, Thank Anonymous, you, thank you so much for the five gifted tier one subs. So it's a whole, whole bunch of people in gutter chat. Palund, Brood Fable, Drowning Dream, Wordsmith, Andy, and Walowski. My goodness. I appreciate all the support, Anon, whoever you are and wherever you are. Democrats voted against that bill. It would have allowed one point. I hear you. But actually, is focused on fixing Six it. Democrats voted against that bill. It would have allowed 1.8 million illegal Im immigrants into the country a year. A lot, a lot of conservatives had a problem with it. These are the six Democrats. But more importantly, back to the original premise. Jocelyn. By the way, when someone you can see Benny Johnson, he's like clapping. He loves that point. When he says like 1.6 million illegals would have been let into the United States per year. What they're talking about is that there's like limits set to where if it exceeds this, then they have to shut down the border in its entirety. Like, let's say that there's like 2,000. I'm trying to remember the exact numbers, but these negotiations are like over what I for like almost a year old now or something. I forget exactly. Um, but it was around like 2,000, like 2,000 crossings a day, and then they shut down the border, meaning like nobody else can really go in and claim asylum. And there was real like international law concerns around this because of people's right to be able to claim asylum and whether that would be denied to these people due to these caps. But these caps are not an indication that it is legal for you to, or you're allowing people to illegally cross into the United States like it's permitted now. No, it's just saying that if there is a mechanism by which the president can shut down the border if it gets too um, uh, intense or if the overflow is too much, of which there were also questions from international law scholars if it was even legal. And then but that's anyway the side commentary. Rachel Morin, Lakin Riley, they are young women who were brutally assaulted and killed by some of the men who were released at the beginning of the administration, well before a negotiated uh, bipartisan bill. Former President Clinton actually referred to Lake and Riley Sunday campaigning for you in Georgia, saying if those men had been properly vetted. Penny Johnson is going, I'm sorry, can we look at Penny Johnson for a second? Look at him going crazy down there. brutally assaulted and killed by some of the men who were released at the beginning of the administration, well before a negotiated uh, bipartisan bill. Former I gotta say, I think he's like excited about it. Well, that's why it's like flambling around like that. But it is weird to just see like when these these murder victims come up, to see Benny Johnson go like, like I, it's not the visual I would, I don't know. It's a weird, weird image to that. I don't know. It's kind of solemn, isn't it? It's a little solemn. I'm mean, going no, very solemn. President Clinton actually referred to Lake and Riley Sunday campaigning for you in Georgia, saying if those men had been properly vetted, Lake and Riley probably would not have been killed. So if it wouldn't have happened, this is well before any negotiation. This is well before Donald Trump got involved in the politics. This is a specific policy decision by your... What is this? What is he doing? Is he trying to cast the spell? It's like spirit bombing Brett Baer trying to load up the question. I'm sorry. This Benny is, he's having a great time. I'm happy for him. I'm happy for him. He's having such a great time. With this question about murder victims. This is well before Donald Trump got involved in the politics. This is a specific policy decision by your administration to release these men into the country. So what I'm saying to you, no, do you no, no, owe Brett, those I families think it's really, I think, an apology? Let me just say, first of all, those are tragic cases. There's no question about that. There is no question about that. And I can't imagine the pain that the families of those victims have experienced for a loss that should not have occurred. So that is true. It is also true. 
that... I'm sorry. Benny Johnson is the most soy jack. <laughs> look, at, look at his face. I'm sorry. He is the most soy jacky out of all political commentators. And I mean this on the left, on the right. He, He's the one I expect to, like, most, like... And there's, you know, I sometimes do that. I think all commentators do that to some extent. But Benny Johnson is... He is an expressive fellow. But if a border security had actually been passed nine months ago, it would be nine months... It's actually, it's like hard for me to pay attention almost. He's like throwing, he's throwing MAGA hats around. And Security whatever. had actually been passed nine months ago. It would be nine months that we would have had more border agents at the border, more support for the folks who are working around the clock, trying to hold it all together. Madam Vice President. To ensure that no future harm would occur. And this election in 20 days, will determine whether we have a president of the United States who actually cares more about fixing a problem, even if it is not to their political advantage in an election, because there was a solution, Brett. Madam Vice President, it was a policy decision in the early part of your administration. I will let one of the mothers talk about it. Take a listen. Because of the Biden-Harris administration open border policies catch and release, they were enrolled in the Alternatives to Detention program. This meant that they were released into the United States. It was not even a full three weeks later that they would take my daughter, Jocelyn Nungare's life. I believe the Biden-Harris administration open border policies are responsible for the death of my daughter. That's the early days. So do you owe them an apology is what I I'm saying. I will tell you that I am so sorry for her loss. I'm so sorry for her loss, sincerely. But let's talk about what is happening right now with an individual Burns who does not want to participate in solutions. Corrupt. It's your fault! About that as well. But do Brett, you want to answer In her? all fairness, I told... I'm sorry. This uh, first piece of commentary from Benny enlightening as always focus guy thank you so much for the primer appreciate it there's no way for harris to win here by the way optics wise politically wise there's just no way for her to win here because number one if anybody involved in any tragedy blames you specifically you can't like counterpoint on how it's not my fault uh buddy okay your daughter's dead but let me just give you a little tricksy you can't do that you're not going to debate bro the family members of dead people it's just it's it's a it's a losing proposition so all she can do is try to share in the grief and then try to explain like our policies were comprehensive and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is why we believe at the moment this was the best policy and we moved on and we didn't want to have family separation anymore. And the remain in Mexico policy was not something we wanted to follow for X, Y, and Z reason. Uh, and I mean, she can't, and if she wanted to sit down and get in the trenches over, let's look at you know, undocumented crime rates versus native born crime rates and whether or not, uh, you know, the policies of our administration has led to an uptick in violent crime, which is continuing to go down, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, any deeper discussion passed, uh, these people came in under the administration, this person did a crime during the administration, and this person went through the process, uh, was uh, getting reviewed or getting looked at, and is now committed this crime. It's going to be on their heads. Now, this is the only conference I could think of that would actually work here in the Harris's situation. And I'm talking here purely PR standpoint, not we're sitting down, we're getting, because I'm, I'm just, sorry, maybe we'd go a little bit more in depth, but I was like half paying attention because of Betty's reactions. I'll try to focus on it more. Um, is if she talks about the violent criminals that came over during Trump's term, including like there were instances of terrorists getting detained during this period under Trump's time in office, then she could be like, there was also these families that happened during those times. This is a, a multi-administration issue trying to control the border. The surge started during the end of the Trump administration. As he was leaving the administration, the surge had started. It was a crisis that was handed to us and we tried to do our best to handle. That is the best like way you could approach this, in my view, if you didn't want this completely to stick to her chest. But there's, this is, there's very little maneuverability here for Harris. Very little maneuverability. It's her weakest issue. Uh, and that's why they're leading with it. I feel awful for what she and her family have experienced. It's your fault! You said repeatedly that the border was secure. When in your mind did it start becoming a crisis? I think it, we've had a broken immigration system transcending, by the way, Donald Trump's administration even before. 
let's let's all be honest about that. I have no pride. See, this is close to it. it maybe it should have been thrown out sooner. There's a. It looks like a tiny edit here. Maybe something was cut. I don't know. But I think sooner as a response, saying this is a multi-administration problem and they are a victim of what has been a problem during Trump, Obama, our administration, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's just... Sorry, there's air raid alarms going off. Uh, that's, I think, the closest she could get. And saying that this is a perfect immigration system, I've been clear, I think we all are, that it needs to be fixed. We need more, I was just down at the border talking with border agents and they will tell you, and I'm sure you probably, I know you investigate and you are a, a serious journalist. They will tell you, we need more judges. We need to process, we need to process those cases faster. We need- And they're choosing what goes up there. Look at what she choose. She is big mad. This is from grandma, grandma. <laughs> she looks like a pleasant woman. She is big mad. Can I finish? What a rude cow. <laughs> I'm sorry, if you're a Trump supporter and the idea of, of scrapping at all with the journalist that's interviewing you makes you come off as a rude cow. That, I'm sorry, that just sounds like dumb sexism to me because if you're voting for Trump as somebody who's like constantly fighting, constantly fighting with the interviewers, and she's trying to get just time to speak, to respond. And you're saying that this is makes her rude. Oh, my God. To me, honestly, I don't like talk about like the woman factor of this very much in this election. But it is a double standard. Need the support for those cases that should be prosecuted. They need more resources. I just don't. Under, I just, it's one. It would be one thing if it was like she doesn't want to let him finish these the bad data for the Biden industry. But the idea of like. The, this inter let me finish like scrapping how dare she that's rude like the rudeness is an issue in the trump era versus and congress ultimately is the only place that that's going to get fixed brett well that's how the system that's, works that's the premise that's, of this question but there were 90 the plus works. executive orders that were rescinded in the first days many of those were trump order policies i'm not going to stay here because there's other things to talk about, but you frequently talk to the Border Patrol Union for support of that bipartisan bill, and they did. They supported it. But they also just endorsed Donald Trump and said, you've been, quote, a failure with border security. Why do you think they said that? I think they're frustrated, and I get it. They want support. They want support, and that's what that border security bill would have done. These guys down at the border, these men and women, they're working hard. They're working around the clock. I get it. There's a lot of people that look back at what you said in 2019 when you first ran for president. Uh, and there have been changes, and you've talked about some of them. When it comes to immigration, you supported allowing immigrants in the country illegally to apply for driver's license, to qualify for free tuition at universities, to be enrolled in free health care. Do you su still support those things? Listen, that was five years ago, and I'm very clear that I will follow the law. I have made that statement over and over again. And as vice president of the United States, that's exactly what I've done, not to mention before. You, if that's the case, you chose a running mate, Tim Walz, who governor of Minnesota. Here's another thing. Harris, when she was running in 2020, had to define herself outside of being a prosecutor and a DA due to the moment in the party with the protests that were going on. And I think one of the ways she did that was trying to throw out these policy platforms to get to the left of Bernie, maybe bring off a little bit of that support to give her some momentum. And in the effort to do that, she made some statements on fracking and otherwise that are no longer useful now that she's actually running for president in the general election in a state like Pennsylvania where fracking employs a lot of people and those are votes that she wants when she's trying to reach over and do these like events to try to convert some Republicans or center-right Republicans over, she cannot be, at the same moment, jumping over to the policies that Donald Trump is trying to say, like, oh, look at you, you're the radical left. And I'm not even saying all these policies. For example, I think uh, if she was to go out and make, like, a public option, which was a Biden policy, which is really, I think, moderate step forward when it comes to the socialization of medicine, um, Make that a part of her campaign. It could be helpful, but it's also not something that polls as relatively high on the list of priorities. It pulled a lot more, a lot higher in 2020 than it does this year. Uh, and we haven't really seen any movement on that either. But I think the legalization of marijuana is probably one of the bigger shifts that she's done to shift herself away from Biden, definitely with his legacy on the drug war. That is maybe going to help, but uh, it's certainly, I don't think, going to help win over the people that she's trying to. I think that's, as she said explicitly, is to help try to turn out black vote the black vote, which is 
polling worse for her than it did for Biden back in 2020. And it's something with such a close election could be vital. Soda, who signed those very things into state law. So do you support that? We are very clear, and I am very clear, as is Tim Walls, that we must support and enforce federal law, and that is exactly what we will do. So decriminalizing border crossings, like you said in 2019. I, I do not believe in decriminalizing border crossings, and I've not done that as vice president, and I will not do that as president. So these are evolutions I, and, and, that but, you've had. No, well, let's be very clear. I'm the only person who's running for president who has prosecuted transnational criminal organizations from the Sinaloa cartel to the Guadalajara quota cartel to people who have trafficked in guns. I don't even, what are these face reactions from Ben? I'm, it's really hard for me to pay attention with Benny just like, what is this face the reaction? The Guadalajara quota cartel. To I just, I, it's, my goodness, man. This is, is this like the adult equivalent of like the baby shark, like bright flashing colors, like key getting jangled in your face to keep your attention? People who have trafficked in guns, drugs, and human beings. I have spent a significant part of my career. Like maybe if she, if we could justify it by just like giving a quick statement about like, this is what I don't like. Pause it for a second. I don't know. Going after people who present a threat to the safety of the American people. And, and cross our border with the intent of doing us harm. People. See, this is the problem with, okay, I, I don't even want to get into the, you know, legal implications of an executive order closing the border by itself with no legislation attached to it. From Jewel Mathewson, when executive order, the border will be closed. Again, they chose to put that up there. What happens when the next president then reverses the executive order? You want to establish it in law through Congress so you can make a, a sustainable long-term solution and not something that could either be done or undone with like the, the flip of a switch, the right on some paper by the next administration. And, and cross our border with the intent of doing us harm and cross our border illegally. And I will do that work as vice president. I take that work quite seriously. This is a time when voters, especially here in Pennsylvania, are inundated with commercials and ads. They just want it to stop because it's every commercial. But many of them add noise, but a few of them seem to break through. This particular one from the Trump campaign has gotten a lot of attention. Kamala supports taxpayer-funded sex changes for prisoners. Surgery. Um, for prisoners. Uh, for prisoners. Every transgender. Well, is this really what they're running with? I'm sorry. Th I, Trump tried to push it, and I and I saw that it's. I saw this ad before, and I thought, it, and they're really putting a lot of money behind this. And I think the point is to try to show as Harris is like a crazy lunatic lefty. But honestly speaking, I think if they were to stick to stuff like fracking or more tabletop issues than these kind of like far off like social issues that are not really going to affect people on the day to day. I, I, I think this plays with a base that's already on their team. You know, this might encourage Republican leaning voters to go out, but it's not going to, I think, flip anybody that they're not going to have already. Like I think centrists. Um, but I think this plays really well to like, you know, your base at well, at least, you know, like it helps you maybe encourage turnout inmate in the prison system would have access. So are you still in support of using taxpayer dollars to help prison inmates or detained illegal aliens to transition to another gender? I will follow the law. And it's a law that Donald Trump actually followed. Um, you're probably familiar with now it's a public report that under Donald Trump's administration, these uh, surgeries were available. I'm sorry, look at the messages he's putting up there. She's under Donald of Trump's shit. administration. Kamala, go to hell already. <laughs> they, they hate her so much. My God, she's not really my cup of tea for a politician. But I mean, man, this is like otherworldly amounts of hate. With now it's a public report that under Donald Trump's administration, these uh, surgeries were available to on a medical necess necessity basis to people in the federal prison system. And I think, frankly, that ad from the Trump campaign is a little bit of like throwing 
you know, stones when you're living in a glass house. The Trump aides say that he never advocated for that prison policy and no gender transition well, surgeries happened during his Well, you know what, you got to take responsible his, for what happened presidency. in your administration. Yeah, no surgeries happened in this pregnancy. It's, it's in so black and white. Would you still advocate? Benny Johnson, I'm sorry, look at the start of this segment when he started to bring it up and look at the end of the segment when she responded like, you know, under Trump, they also were were offering these surgeries to prisoners because it's labeled under mental health care and uh, like health care that would be like considered something that would be treated and then she starts laying out like you know you might call it crazy and radical but like it was happening under the trump administration too and like at the start of this and at the end of it look at him House. The Trump aides say that he never advocated <laughs> I'm for that. I'm sorry, that's funny as fuck. Okay, I'm, okay, let's continue. Let's get through this. Man, I didn't know watching this with Betty Johnson would be so much fun. Prison policy and no gender transition well, surgeries happened during his Well, you know what, you got to take responsible his, for what happened presidency. in your administration. Yeah, no surgeries happened in this pregnancy. It's, it's in so black and white. Would you still advocate for using... What was that last response? If the service was available during his presidency and none were provided, it doesn't mean the service wasn't available. I mean, that just means that there's probably not a lot of prisoners that are actually trying to get sex change surgery from the government while in prison. Uh, probably because I think getting sex probably is not the most supportive environment in the United States for trans people, the United States penal system, to be blunt. Taxpayer dollars for gender reassignment. I will surgeries. follow the law, just as I, I, I think Donald Trump this. would say he did. You would have a say as president. I, like I said, I think it's really... <laughs> we at the Aryan Brotherhood stand with our trans brothers in the white movement. <laughs> I, I just don't think that's happening in prison. Like, I'm, I'm sure they get some support from some places, but, I mean, come on. He spent $20 million on those ads trying to create a sense of fear in the voters because he actually has no plan in this election that is about focusing on the needs of the American people. Whereas... At $20 million on that ad, on an issue that, as it relates to the biggest issues that affect the American people, it's really quite remote. And again, his policy was no different. Why is he making phases again? He didn't... Why is, look at... It, he's we, doing the same movement, but now with less cheer. We are, though. They say plans for the, That's interesting that she brought up the amount... I told... I said earlier that they put a lot of money behind that ad. I forgot the amount of money. She just said $20 million. So she's not only saying that this... This was provided during Trump's administration, but she's saying, isn't it interesting that of all the issues that are affecting Americans, she's like the Trump campaign decided to spend $20 million on talking about these trans prison surgeries. Like, it's, it's an interesting angle. I mean, I like it. I think it's one of the not only one of the better defenses, but turning on the offense. For the but American we'll people, I'm offering a plan to deal with. A Look at that. See, now we're ready to move on quickly. I'm just. I don't know. I think she, you know, the first one, rough waters, choppy waters. This one's, you know, we've left the clouds a little bit. We're back into some mildish waters. That after some maneuvering. The biggest issues that affect the American people is really quite remote. And again, his policy was no different. Look at where we are, though. They on say plans for the American we'll people, I'm offering a plan to deal with affordable housing. I'm offering a plan to deal with what we need to do to strengthen small businesses, which are the backbone of America's economy. I am offering a plan that is about taking care of young parents and giving them the support they need. My plans for the economy will strengthen the economy, as have been reviewed by 16 Nobel laureates, uh, Goldman Sachs, Moody's, and recently the Wall Street Journal, which have all studied our plans and have indicated my plans for our economy would strengthen our economy. His would make them weaker, why do you would think ignite more people inflation, say, and invite a recession by the middle of next year. Those you, are the facts. Why do you think more people say they trust him on the economy than they trust you? I think that when you look at... Can I just throw this out there? I hate this stuff. I mean, on one hand, like, I understand the question. Like, you could use a question to answer a concern that a people have by saying the polling indicates this. But if... It's also kind of indicative of the press to not just be like, hey, the people, like, why do you think the majority of the public think Big Bigfoot is real? Like, what if it's just not, like, it's nonsense? Is it not indicative on you to introduce, like, you know, like, for example, when he was, like, clarifying the legislative data earlier or the legislation or the exact, like, he was throwing out the, like, yeah, that was HR or whatever, the, who gives a crap, whatever. When he was throwing that out, that out there earlier, 
Why not in a moment like this when she's saying this? ...and invite a recession by the middle of next year. He could say something like, well, you know, the majority... That is true that a lot of economists say that his plan would increase the, increase the deficit much more. And many economists predict a recession if he was to go through with this tariff policy, etc. But no, we know what network this is. I'm not trying to be, you know, oh, too bitter about it. But I'm just saying, like... I'm just saying, you know, we're halfway through. That was for the earlier questions. It's not for this moment. Why Those you, are the facts. Why do you think more people say they trust him on the economy than they trust you? I think that when you look at... Like, out of all the things you could ask about the economy, like, why not break down, like, the tariffs and the breakdown, like, the deficit or break down fiscal responsibility, which used to be a huge talking point on Fox, but now is, like, gone. Why just ask about the polling? I'm not saying it's not, it's an, like, not a useful question. It's just maybe the fourth question you should ask. An analysis of our plans for what we would do as president of the United States. It has been clear to those who study and understand how economic policy works that moving forward, because I do believe the American people are ready to turn the page on the divisiveness and the, the type of rhetoric that has come out of Donald Trump, people are ready to chart a new way forward. And they want a president who has a plan for the future and a plan that is sound and will strengthen our country. My plan for the economy does exactly that. His plan would be, again, to give tax cuts to billionaires and the biggest corporations in our country and blow up our deficit. It's interesting you said turn the page, Madam Vice President. You were asked on two different shows last week what, if anything, you would do differently than President Biden. Here's yeah. what you said. Would you have done something See, right here, advocating for legalization of marijuana would now be the thing that he can throw out there. I don't know if that'll play well with the Fox News audience, but she calling for it's just complete decriminalization or legalization, either or, is a break with Biden that is significant, especially considering that the black community, which she's trying to win back over, which is not saying that she's lost it. It's like 74% compared to 82% with Biden, but those margins, close election, they matter. Uh, I don't think that's the audience you're speaking to much right now, but it is something you could bring up as a differentiation. Uh, outside of that, I don't know, I guess it would just be new proposals, but like a lot of it is like a rehashing of like stuff like the child tax credit, which, you know, some would say was a successful policy. Differently than President Biden during the past four years. Uh, there is not a thing that comes to mind in terms of, and I've been a part of, of, of most of the decisions that have had impact. Under a Harris administration, what would the major changes be? And what would stay the same? Sure. Well, I mean, I'm obviously not Joe Biden. Um, I know. And so yes. that would be one change yes. in terms of... Yes. But also, it, I think it's important to say with, you know, 28 days to go, I'm not Donald Trump. So you're not Joe Biden, you're not Donald Trump, but, but nothing comes to mind that you would do differently? Let me be very clear. My presidency will not be a continuation of Joe Biden's presidency. And like every new president that comes in to office, I will bring my life experiences, my professional experience. This is the moment where you throw out some differences on differences on policy. For example, like he doesn't need to scrap every progressive policy she threw out in 2020 in an effort to win over like 0.5% of Republicans in the state to like margin out on the what? You can throw out a few of those again, policies that Biden didn't want to take up. You throw out a few other policies, say, like, these are priorities. For example, I saw he was, she was on Charlemagne the God's podcast, and he, she was talking about, like, ch uh, maternity, uh, ch uh, maternity uh, black women going into childbirth and dying at higher rates. Like, these are differences that she could say, like, our perspectives gives us differences of focus. You know, my background allows me to know more and feel like I can go at this issue differently and I want to dedicate these resources which haven't been dedicated previously because Biden was focused on uniting the country. I now want to build a path forward. Biden laid the foundation. Here come the pillars. Something like that. It does she doesn't need to like throw out a million different policies, but like two, three, hell, even one. And fresh and new um, ideas. I represent a new generation of leadership. A lot of apples. Thank you so much for the tier one sub. I appreciate that. I, for example, am someone who has not spent the majority of my career in Washington, D.C. I invite ideas, whether it be from the Republicans who are supporting me, who are, were just on stage. See, with I don't know if the thing about not spending a majority of her career in D.C. so she can, I don't know if 
pointing back to California is the smartest, but that is a difference. Um, but this idea of like, oh, I want to have a Republican on my cabinet, that's different than Biden. Yeah, Biden campaigned on the unity message. I don't really see how that's enough of a differentiation to mention. I guess like on this network, you want to mention that at some point that you're reaching across the aisle in order to try to get some support back, but it's not that big of a difference. With me minutes ago and the business sector and others who can contribute to the decisions that I make about, for example, my plan for increasing the supply of housing in America and bringing down the cost of housing, addressing the issue of small businesses, which is about working with the private sector to bring more capital and access to capital to our small business leaders, including my plan mm -hmm. for a $25,000 down payment assistance for first time home buyers Preach. and for small businesses extending the tax deduction from $5,000 to $50,000. We've heard a lot about those plans in, in recent days. Your campaign slogan is a new way forward and it's time to turn the page. You've been vice president for three and a half years. So what are you turning the page from? Well, first of all, turning the page from the last decade in which we've been burdened with the kind of rhetoric coming from Donald Trump that has been designed and implemented to divide our country and have Americans literally point fingers at each other. Rhetoric and an approach to leadership that suggests- Quick, that Benny, find some more comments to put up there. Strength of a leader is- based Get another on one, calling her a bitch. Maybe that'll help. Who you beat down instead of what we all know. The strength of leadership is based on who you lift up. You, the strength of an American president. president, which is one who understands that the vast majority of us have more in common than what separates us. Madam that Vice is President, more than 70% of people That is about posters. turning the page on rhetoric that people are frankly- She's concerned. wearing the earrings again. They still believe this thing about like, ear, like Bluetooth earrings popping her answers into your ears. My exhausted goodness. Exhausted of Brett. More than 70% of people. Have you ever looked at Kamala's nose? Weird. Okay tell the country is on the wrong track. They say the country is on the wrong track. If it's on the wrong track, that track follows three and a half years of you being vice president and President Biden being president. That is what they're saying, 79% of them. Why are they saying that? If you're turning the page, you've been in office for three and a half years. And Donald Trump has been running for office. But you've been the person holding on, the office. Come on. Madam you Vice and I President. both know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you and I know what I'm talking about. I actually about. don't. What are you talking about? What I'm talking about is that over the last decade, but people you're the have become. Of power. But listen, over the last decade, it is clear to me, and certainly the Republicans who are on stage with me, the, the, the former chief of staff to the president, Donald Trump, uh, former defense secretaries, national security advisor, and his vice president, one that he is unfit to serve, that he is unstable, that he is dangerous, and that people are exhausted with someone who professes to be a leader who spends full time demeaning and, and, and engaging. I don't know if she tweaked this a little bit more. I mean, this is a pivot to Trump, but if you wanted to make the pivot to Trump, you have to tie it more to the question. Something like people don't like the track of the country is headed because people don't like that. We're getting more divided. People don't like that. Our, our tensions are, are becoming uh, harder in our communities due to our political divisions. People don't like the increasing in political violence. And these are things that are impossible to separate from from the decade of Donald Trump's involvement and that uh, populist led in. See, you could try to tie this in maybe a little bit more because it feels like she just went from point A to point B, like just like a jump instead of like, a, how does Trump put it, a weave? I think that's how he puts it. In personal grievances and it being about him Madam instead Vice of President. The And then she could also talk about, you know, since we were given the White House, uh, the mess was so great that we had to deal with crisis after crisis and we're leaving these crises trying to head to the right direction and the American people are still feeling the pain from this but we're also seeing the gr I mean there's there's ways that you could try to bah, I don't know these are she's like it feels like she's almost like she's shooting the uh, on a few of these she's shooting the shot and it's like bouncing on the rim and like just teetering on the edge and then falls off
And American people, people are case, tired of that. If that's the case, why is half the country supporting him? Why is he beating you in a lot of swing states? Why, if he's as bad as you say, that half of this country... Look at that dono. Which dono? I don't see it. Case, tired of that. If that's the case, why is half the country supporting him? Why is he beating you? Wait, when people say this, by the way, when people say when half the country is supporting him, you mean voting for him. When people say support, I think some people assume, like, oh, there's 50% of the country that wants Harris, 50% of the country that wants Trump. No, there's maybe like 30% there, 30% there, and then there's a big percentage in the middle that's like, ah, I will choose one or the other. And I'm, at broad strokes, when we say support, what we mean is that when all is said and done, Donald Trump might end up winning the Electoral College because he was able to get enough support. As in, when we say support, if in, in this context and how he's putting it would mean convince them to view for vote for him, not support as in, I want him to be president because he was my pick and I think he's the best option. A little different than that support, right? Because if we're talking about polling, not uh, just like favorability, because Trump's favorability is not positive. In a lot of swing states, why, if he's as bad as you say, that half of this country is now supporting this person who could be the 47th president of the United States? Why is that happening? This is an election for president of the United States. It's not. Oh, I don't know why Benny Johnson's class. Is that really like a good question? You have you have the future nominee for president of the United States, and you're asking like, if this person that you're running against is so bad, why do they have supporters? We'll talk about why she thinks he's bad, not that there's people who like him despite the fact that he's bad. You can find every politician in history, you can find people that Occurred. support them Occurred. despite the fact that they're bad or good or whatever. Like, that doesn't, I don't think it's a question you can ask. It's, I don't know if it's a pertinent question. I drew the dog man, thank you for the two dollars. Appreciate it. So, is there, a, is there a question to that? Uh, a oh, vote Harris, she has a brown badge. Thank you. That was very useful. We all are enlightened by your commentary. It's supposed to be easy. I know, but it's not it's supposed as... to be. It, it, it is not supposed to be a so cakewalk for So are they misguided, the 50%? Listen, are they I'm... stupid? What, oh, what is that worth $2, really? I would never say that about the American people. And in fact, if you listen to Donald Trump, if you watch any of his rallies, he's the one who tends to demean and belittle and diminish the American people, he's the one who talks about an enemy within, within, an enemy within, talking about the American people, suggesting he would turn the American military on the American people. We asked that the, question to the former president today. Harris Faulkner had a, a town hall, and this is how he responded. I heard about that. They, they were saying I was like threatening. I'm not threatening anybody. They're the ones doing the threatening. They do phony investigations. I've been investigated more than Alphonse Capone. He was the greatest. Oh no, it's right. true. We no, but think of it. It's called weaponization of government. It's a terrible thing. So, Brett, I, I'm sorry. It what am I supposed? Wait, what was I supposed to take from that? What was I supposed to take from that? Wait, was the, where, what did he refute? I heard about that. They, they were saying I was like threatening. I'm not threatening anybody. They're the ones doing the threatening. They that's that's it. He's like, I'm not threatening anybody. That takes away the fact that he said that there's an enemy within that I will deploy the National Guard against the military against like that. Like, who's the enemy within who that has to be a threat towards someone. He also has threatened multiple times before to arrest his political opponents just because he says, oh, never mind. Ooh, that doesn't mean anything. What does that mean? do phony investigations. I've been investigated more than Alphonse Capone. He was the greatest oh gangster. No, it's right. true. We don't no, think of it. It's called weaponization of government. It's a terrible thing. So, Brett, I, I'm sorry, and with all due respect, that clip was see, not. The defense he, would be, when he said he was going to go after the enemy within, he meant the rioting Antifas, not, not like Democrats and like the political opposition or just peaceful protest. That would be the defense, not I didn't threaten anybody. The I didn't threaten anybody defense is just like cowardice. The real, uh, I think, attack here from Trump would be, of course, I'm going to deploy the National Guard to defend small businesses. I don't want the chaos of the riots anymore. It's kind of hard since a lot of them happened under his watch. But I mean, like that would be the pitch, not whatever that was. He has been saying about the enemy within that he has repeated 
when he's speaking about the American people, that's not what you just showed. Well, he was asked no, about that no, specific... No, 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 that's not what you just showed in all no, fairness no, no, no. and I'm respect you, to you. I'm that was the question that we asked him. Uh, you didn't show that, and here's the bottom line. He has repeated it many times, and you and I both know that. And you and I both know... Why wouldn't we play the clip that he said and then his rejection of it? Why would we just play his rejection of it and not the clip of what he originally said for full context? Oh, that he has talked about turning the American military on the American people. He has talked about going after people who are engaged in peaceful protest. He has talked about locking people up because they disagree with him. This is a democracy. And in, in a democracy, the president of the United States in the United States of America should be willing to be able to handle criticism without saying he'd lock people up for doing it. And this is what is at stake, which is why you have someone like the former chairman of the... What is Benny Johnson doing? What is he speaking out over there? Chief of staff <laughs> saying what Mark Milley has said about Donald Trump being a threat to the United States of America. He's quoted in the Bob Woodward book that way, yes. L let me ask you this, no, Madam no, Vice no, President. You call Donald Trump... Let's not diminish the significance you, you, you of that. You call Donald Trump... Um, He's misguided. You say now he's he is unstable. unstable. He is unstable. Brad. Uh, he's not well. well. You say he's it, mentally not stable. Uh, he's not stable. Let me ask you this. And, you and told many interviewers that Joe Biden was on his game, that ran around circles on his staff. When did you first notice that President Biden's mental faculties appeared diminished? Joe Biden, I have watched in from the Oval Office to the Situation Room. And he has the judgment and the experiment and experience to do exactly what he has done in making very important decisions on behalf of the American people. There Joe Biden, no concerns right this, this is because of the problem from Harris's perspective, right? The answer, so they, whatever the answer would be, like if Biden had a great record, but in recent years, as he's gotten older, you know, he's slowed down in some ways, and you know, they you know, they've changed up their schedule in order to accommodate, you know, as old age comes around, and he took the responsible decision to step down. A decision like somebody like Donald Trump would never be able to do because he's too much of an egomaniac to ever let go of the reins of power. And that's why in 2020, he rejected the Democratic results of the election, and he's been a sore loser ever since. And democracy doesn't work if both parties don't tango. Like something along those lines, I think is the... I'm, I'm sure that there is a pathway to navigate this, but the framing like from the outset, it's just like there's no way to answer this directly, immediately... And come out looking good uh and but the biggest problem here for i think harris honestly isn't the way that she because maybe she could answer like that maybe she knows how to maneuver to then answer like that the big problem is that she doesn't want to piss off the person who basically handed the nomination over to her when an open convention was still uh you know in the air and there was a question of whether the delegates would just choose who the next nominee is and the delegates ultimately went with Harris, but I think in large part that was because Biden kind of shut down the whole conversation and said, I'm choosing Harris. Joe Biden is not on the ballot. I understand. And but, Donald Trump, Donald Trump but is. But you talked about it. And Donald Trump After is. After George Clooney said and within a few minutes of talking to Donald President Biden Trump, at a fundraiser that he thought this Brett, was not the same Brett, Joe Biden that we saw on the Donald debate stage. Donald Trump is on the ballot. I understand. You met with him at least once a week for three and a half years. You didn't have any concerns? I think the American people have a concern about Donald Trump, which is why the people who know him best, including leaders of our national security community, have all spoken out, even people who worked for him in the Oval Office, worked with him in the Situation Room. Listen to this. I bet. Listen to this one. Okay. I can't imagine Kamala negotiating a ceasefire or foreign policy with this tone. Because, number one, this is an interview with a hostile news network, okay? This is not a, or, or like an aggressive news network, whatever you want to call it. This is not a private negotiation. I assume her tone would be a little different. And what would, what, because she's aggressive? Because she's raising her voice? All things that Donald Trump has done and will do into the future? Like, what, what exactly about the tone makes it like, if you're, if you imagine that she's going to debate or negotiate, she's not even debating, but negotiate in private like she does in a public TV interview. I don't know. It feels a little, feels a little silly.
people who worked for him in the Oval Office, worked with him in the Situation Room, and have said he is unfit and dangerous and should never be president of the United States again, including his former vice president, which is why the job was open for him to choose another running mate. So that is a fact. That is a fact. Madam Vice President, two more things. You were asked on 60 Minutes about the biggest threat that the world faces, that the U.S. faces. This is what you said. Which foreign country do you consider to be our greatest adversary? Wait, can I guess what the question is going to be? If it's Iran, then why did you guys not immediately reintroduce? Uh, I think it's going to have to do with like sanctions policy and not adding pressure on the Iranian regime, maybe? I don't know. I'm just, obvious, I'm just swinging in the dark here. This um, one in mind, which is Iran. Iran has American blood on their hands, okay? This, this attack on Israel, 200 ballistic missiles. Um, I also still think this is an answer I disagree with. Iran is the biggest threat to American national security, really? I think this is a, like an of-the-moment answer, very much. What we need to do to ensure that um, Iran never achieves the ability to be a nuclear power, that is one of my highest priorities. A number of extra experts thought you would say China. Um, the FBI director had said that. But you said Iran. If that's the case, what do you say to critics uh, who look at the actions of your administration and say you're not acting like Iran is the number one threat? Well, I, I will tell you most recently, whether it was in April or in October, and then several hours on each occasion that Iran posed a threat to Israel. I was there. Uh, most recently in the Situation Room, in the most recent attack, working with the heads of our military and doing what America must always do to defend and to support Israel in its requirement to defend itself and to give American support to be able to allow Israel to have the resources to defend itself against attack, including from Iran and Iran's terrorist proxies in the region. Right. And that is and, and my commitment Iran. to that is unyielding and unwavering. Critics just say that you either relaxed or failed to, to enforce sanctions on Iran, allowing all of this money to flow let, into Iran, like let, billions. Let's in go back oil to Donald profits. Trump, who, who pulled that, out of who pulled out of a deal that would have actually put but here Iran are the, in check. The estimates and then in billions it was during Donald Trump's that administration that Iran, Iran regime that, that, that we had a, an American military base that was attacked, where American soldiers suffered traumatic brain injuries and Donald Trump dismissed them as headaches, not to mention Madam how Donald It's a strong point on the issue. It's not an answer to the oral question, but it's a strong pivot. It is a strong pivot. Donald so, Trump has, all of this money has treated and has talked about America's military years. and military service people Critics calling them that it goes suckers to and losers, Hamas has diminished and the significance. We're talking over each other. I apologize. Well, I, and I, but, and I, I, not, I would like that we would have a, a conversation that is grounded in full assessment of the facts, which includes, I think this interview is supposed to be about the choices that your viewers should be presented about this election. And the contrast is important. Yes, ma'am. And, and on we... the subject of Iran, I am offering what should be an, an important contrast that is presented for folks to make a decision and there are that they feel. Who look at what the. Sometimes I feel like what happens is. He like she's in the middle of an answer. She's she's like eventually the interviewer or person she's debating will like interrupt her answer and then she'll like try to assert control. And sometimes, like this instance, she kind of wins control and then it's back to her. And I think, and this happens to me sometimes, and that's why I think I'm noting it, in that like effort to like reassert control that you were talking, you kind of forget what you were trying to say in the first place. And so you you start throwing out words and you start trying to say it. And it felt like she was, it felt like that for me, looking from the outside, that she finally got re, re control and it kind of like knocked her off a bit. Administration did and say and think differently. Madam Vice President, they're wrapping me very hard here. 
I hope you got to say what you wanted to say about Donald Trump. There are a lot of things. It is that, more to say. I have there, much there more are to say, a lot actually. of things that people want to learn about you <laughs> and your say. policies, yes. and that's why I'm, I invited invite you everyone here. to go to Kamala Harris. Well, we didn't really talk about her, her policies. We talked about like the Biden administration policy. I, I, I wish when she when he was asked about differentiation, she could have dif differentiated herself based upon some policy proposals, but they didn't really get to any policy discussion except for like a few like tax credits and stuff that she's already been throwing out there like crazy. Com, and you will see that I have 80 uh, pages of policies that are quite comprehensive and should be um, accessible to anyone who would like to read them. And it includes what I intend to do about affordable housing, what I intend to do about small businesses, what I do. And that's why we invited to you here in our economy, to see where you were in 2019 to, and to where you are now. America's military and ensure we have the most lethal and best fighting force in the world. Madam Vice she President, that and they're giving I, me a hard wrap Well, I thank you for the time. I thank you for the time. It's good to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you. What? Ah, Jesus Christ. Mark. Okay, that's enough Benny commentary. God damn. I grabbed the wrong ear. That, that, it was so loud and it was so painful that I ended up grabbing the wrong ear. It disorientated me so much because I only have one headphone and I gotta remove that. Jesus. My goodness, that came out of nowhere. <laughs> so he doesn't pause at all during these things, does he? I don't I don't understand that. At that point, you're just kind of everybody in the audience is like 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 friend. You're just there to kind of like watch it with them, like, whoa, oh, 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 oh. like why not like pause and add comments? I guess you can wait till the end to add that commentary, but I don't know. I don't know. Either way, um, Dylan Burns is clearly senile, obviously. Um, how do I view this debate? I mean, debate. How do I view this interview? Um, I think at best, you could call it like a Fearig victory, but I think it might un honestly be a wash. The problem is that you're going to have the section of immigration. There was very few ways that she could have come out of that looking good. And I think that the clips from that are going to be damaging. Um, especially when they're taking the quotes from those people who lost their children. Um, I think that when she talked about uh, that, her response to the section about like the trans surgeries, I think it was actually pretty strong. I think she was able to get out of those early choppy waters quickly. Uh, and she was able to, I think, kind of grab the narrative more in the middle uh, towards the end. It's kind of hard to say. She was able to hit a little bit on Iran, but then she didn't want to directly answer the question. So it looked dodgy. Um, I think that, Honestly, this is not going to convince many people to join her side. I don't think anybody that's in her camp is going to be flipped by this either. I think we're now talking about the small margin of independent to maybe center-right Republicans that she was trying to aim for to convince them to vote for her by going into this aggressive environment that Donald Trump does not want to go into on his side. Um, he doesn't want to do another debate with her. He didn't want to do a debate with 60 Minutes. She's rejected a Times interview, but I would say something like this is more aggressive than a Times interview. The closest Trump did was that a Bloomberg interview, but Bloomberg is supposed to be like a business rag, which Trump as the Republican pro-business candidate should have, you know, you would think that would be his environment, but because of his tariff proposals and other stuff that has caused a lot of concern amongst economists, it became a little bit of a hostile interview, especially after he started fighting with the moderator. I think that's probably going to be the most aggressive interview he gets until the election is over. And I assume Harris is probably not going to dip her toes in any more aggressive interviews than this meaning that this is probably the last aggressive interview of both campaigns, and the rest of this uh, is going to be... Uh, probably there will be some that are more aggressive, but nothing like this. So I would say it's a wash. She took hold at the start, was kind of fighting over hold at the, at the end. At the beginning, it was a pretty monstrously bad start. Well, and I don't know if I would say monstrously, monstrously bad, but not good start. And so it all kind of together makes me think it's a wash. And it also depends on what clips are put out there, how the Harris campaign talks about the interview afterwards. Um, I wish she got to get more policy across. I wish she got to talk more about, you know, what she wants to do different than Biden, um, because it would seem to just be talking about a difference in experience from coming from California politics. And I don't think that's going to matter much to a lot of people. I think that is a difference, but not really much one that's going to, you know, cause a lot of like, oh, voters be like, yeah, you are different than Biden. Not really, because I don't think most people are going to appreciate that difference. And so I, I think this ends up being a wash. I don't know. I, th I think at the end of the day, it might help that she can say, I went on Fox. Trump won't debate me. I went on the 
like hard networks trump won't do that like she can try to do that i think that might help her but i think it'll be marginal so i think that the most likely outcome was this was going to be marginal no matter what how it goes unless it's disaster disastrous for fox news and she does very well or it's disastrous for her and she does unbelievably bad so i'm leaning towards this being a wash um i mean i thought the vice presidential debate was a wash and it seems like it was afterwards and i feel similarly to this it's good that she's doing interviews like this though it's good that she's putting herself under pressure you want presidential candidates under pressure uh but she really needs to find a way to either connect what she wants to shift to to the question being asked more like for example how she was talking about how americans don't see the country going the in the right direction then she shifts to trump she needs to talk about how trump set the conditions of the pathway of the country right now people are concerned about a second trump term uh, people are concerned about the rhetoric in the country and how trump has influenced that rhetoric and you know there's there's ways that maybe if she just spends more time in the public sphere she'll get sharper on answering these but uh it feels like harris is on an upward trajectory in her rhetoric in the public eye trump is in a downward trajectory um, when it comes to his rhetoric in the public eye due to this general deterioration. And I don't know at one point what I consider that they've crossed. Because I feel like Harris is still like adjusting to the spotlight. Trump is deteriorating in the spotlight. And I don't know at what point I would say that they've crossed. If that hasn't occurred already and we just don't know. But uh, yeah, I think it's a wash. Interesting though. Interesting. Especially Benny's reaction. He seemed to have a blast.